Hello everyone and welcome to week 12 of UAGT Tea Room. Yay! Oh, sorry, I mean week 11. Week 11, sorry, I skipped a number. Um, so my name is Shirley and I'm the current president of the Badminton Club. I will be your host for this week's podcast, uh, which we will be talking about what it's like to be playing uh, mixed slash a bit of women's doubles at more of a national and international level um, and what training looks like associated with that. So with me today, we do have Josephine Wu. Uh, she is currently a member of Team Canada and first represented Canada internationally in 2008 at the Pan Am Junior Badminton Championships. Her current mixed doubles partner is named Josh Hobart Yu, and they hold a world ranking of 30, the last time I checked, <laughs> uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, through Badminton World Federation, uh, also known as BWF. So uh, welcome, Josephine. Thank you for joining us again today. Thanks for having me, Shirley. Yeah. So um, to start off, I just kind of want to get to know a little bit about you and a little bit about how you started in badminton, just the very beginning. Yeah, so uh, my mom actually grew up watching a lot of badminton. Like, she's Malaysian, so she grew up watching Lee Chang Wei mm. and, like, Wang Chun Han, one of the, like, older big names. Yeah, mm -hmm. so when she immigrated here, she played a lot uh, at the rec centers, like, Kinsman with my dad. And I was just running around on the side, and they, I kept, you know, they were worried about me, like, losing sight of me. So as soon as I was old enough, uh, I think at the age of five and a half, when I was strong enough to pick up my first racket, uh, yeah, I just started there, and I told my dad I liked it, and so he enrolled me in a camp at the Royal Glenora Club, mm -hmm. and I told my dad I really liked it, so I just started training since then, yeah. Yay. So what was it? Um, so you said you were, sorry, how old did you say you were again? Five and a half. Five and a half, oh my goodness, okay, and then so you started at the Royal Glenora Club, are you mm -hmm. still currently there now? No, so I actually, uh, the Royal Glenora wasn't accepting, um, they're only accepting full members then when I okay. was there for a camp. And like, I was five and a half. My dad's like, how can I, you know, pay money to go into a private club, which is like a 10 grand initiation fee oh my God. for something my five and a half year old said mm -hmm. I like. Like, I could change my mind the day after. So mm -hmm. they told us to go to the Dare Club because mm -hmm. they're accepting like non members. Okay. So I was there for. I think till I was 13 and mm -hmm. then I switched to the Glenora club mm -hmm. and then around three years ago, the head coach of the Glenora club actually opened his own club, which is now the, the active band club. So that's where I am right now. Okay. So have you been with them the whole time while you're transitioning through like junior high, high school training and whatnot? Yeah. So I've been with, uh, coach Wong. Yeah, okay. who's the head coach of Be Active. So I've been with him mm -hmm. since I was 13. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, sounds, that sounds really cool. It seems like you're really able to build a strong relationship with your coach just because you've been with them for so long and yeah. they would really know how to uh, pinpoint where your strengths are and where areas of improvement are just because they know how you play so well. Yeah, he definitely knows. Like He points out like whether like on a day-to-day -day basis like what I'm doing – better or like worse or what I did better before and mm -hmm. like just little changes because like when you play all the time and like you don't really notice certain things yeah and so yeah. it's it's really helpful for him to be there and point it out like when I can't pinpoint mm -hmm. it myself mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. that's so fair so was he oh, I guess he was the coach or I don't know if he was your only coach when you started um uh when you played at your first tournament was he um uh, internationally or like just like in general oh sorry when you played um the first international one uh so because he has to well yeah was he yeah he was okay no no i don't think i transitioned to glenora then oh no 2009 was when i first transitioned to the glenora so, yeah, 2008, he, he was there at the tournament as a coach, but he wasn't okay. my coach yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, well, let's go talk more a little bit about your first big tournament, I guess, just because, like, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting point, I think, like, where you probably start growing a lot, just because mm -hmm. in international, I guess, um, did you play any national tournaments before then? 
I'm not sure. Yeah, just like the circuit, like they like they call them the elite, the junior elites now. Oh, it's just okay. like every province has one. Yeah, it's for under age of fourteen and sixteen. Oh, okay. Like the U14, U16 bracket. Or was it? Oh, no. 16 and 19, sorry. Oh, They've okay. changed it now, but before it was only U16, U19. Oh, and then everyone over 16 was an adult. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. been a while. It's. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that was old. I'm playing the big stuff now. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So, up, up before uh, you played your big tournaments both like your first national slash international one mm-hmm. um aside from the fact that it was kind of fun for you was there anything that motivated you to want to compete more um in a more like highly competitive realm because you could have just because what i did and some a lot of people that i know did was they kept playing badminton but they did stay more on, like you know the recreational side mm-hmm. they played like badminton alberta tournaments like every now and then so like mm-hmm. what was the motivator for you to really try and go to like these national and international tournaments um i think it was just more of like something for myself of like how far can i go like how good mm-hmm. can i be because mm-hmm. i felt that as a kid i kept playing the same people over and over like you probably understand mm-hmm. like you play the same tournaments mm-hmm. the same people and to me like that was a bit boring or i got tired of it like i'm not winning all these but just like you play the same person, you know their game, you know what they're going to do. And it's just, for me, like, that desire to play different people, like, whether mm-hmm. win or lose, I didn't care. I just wanted to go out in there and just play. And and I yeah. think because of that, like, I just started taking, like, gradual steps towards, like, branching out into, like, national and international. But also, like, the people around me had a huge influence. Like, mm-hmm. if it wasn't for them to take that initial step, then I wouldn't have followed in their footsteps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's fair. That sounds really good. It seems like like diversity is always very helpful for people because yeah. you get to say something that I can really relate to the part where it's like even though you are always winning or you're not always losing, like you really get to know people in general, like their playing yeah. style when you play them so often. Yeah. So what was it first like when you I guess let's start with nationals, just because that's one. Yeah, well, that would be one of your first steps before going into mm-hmm. the league. What What was it like when you first played your first national tournament? From what I remembered, I was not favored to win or anything. It was just like I think I was like three years under age at my first nationals. I thought you were just three years old. Um, it was just I just went in there and just like had fun. Like I didn't think mm-hmm. of it any differently just because I was so young and it was just such a new experience to me that I was just there just to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it was like fun because no expectations. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just there to try to keep up in a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did anything change for you like mindset wise after your first nationals tournament when you did play? Yeah, I really wanted to win. <laughs> I think that was something <laughs> like growing up, like to me, winning is not everything. Mm-hmm. But I do, I don't hate losing, but yeah, I, I, I like, to, I prefer, if I'm out there on the court, I'm playing to win, regardless of whoever's on the other side. Mm, that's fair. Yeah. So like, like kind of having that competitive edge to you type of thing. Yeah. Like I'm not like, I'm not like, I'm sad if I lose, but I mm. know that it's just motivation to, you know, do better the next time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really good. So as you journey through your nationals, um, national tournament uh how long did you train for before you wanted to or before you went into international play uh so actually i didn't know about these international tournaments so my first international tournament was as you said the the junior pan am games Mm -hmm. but you need to qualify for those and so how it works is that Bampton Canada takes uh, your results from national. So you have to place top four okay. in order to be invited to f- play that event. So I didn't sign up to play international. It was just like, oh, an opportunity came. Okay. I was selected. Now do I go? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. sorry, just to backtrack. So what were you, when you first started training, what were you training for? Were you still training for mix at this time? Oh, no. I, well, like when you're young, you don't really specialize because mm-hmm. everyone just kind of, plays everything I definitely would think I was more singles based as a kid just because I was a lot stronger 
I was a lot stronger. I was stronger for like for my age. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely focused more on singles and a bit of doubles. And mix was by far my worst event, ironically. Oh. Yeah. I actually played double style with my partner back then. Oh okay. so like we do rotation. Yeah. Okay. So your first Pan Am tournament, what did you play then? I played all events actually. I won the doubles. Ooh. Yeah, singles, I think I only made quarters. Mix, maybe second round. We had a tough draw, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so interesting to, like, see your journey kind of start out where you, like, your mix was pretty much, like, at the bottom of your list. Yeah. (laughs) And now you're, like, specializing in mix and, like, you want to go to the the Olympics playing mix. Yeah. That is insane. So how did how did that happen? I'm just curious. Like, like what kind of changed to make you transition like complete oppositely? Um, I think it was when my mixed partner. So I played with the same partner. His name's Nathan Osborne. So I played with him growing up, and mm-hmm. as soon as he was stronger than me, and we started playing more of a mixed style, okay. then all of a sudden I felt really lost because mm-hmm. I've never played proper mix before, and mm-hmm. so um, uh, John Vandervet, who was uh, kind of a coach then he kind of taught me and as well as uh coach Wong so the be active head coach's wife Mm -hmm. she really helped me uh with my mixed game and she just taught me like just like the know-hows and what to cover because like Mm -hmm. I feel like mix is a bit where it's a lot of trial and error where you have to play shots and then know the consequences in order to learn what like like not to play that shot next time okay yeah, so I feel like mix is actually one of the hardest events. Yeah, so after really? she taught me more and I practiced more, okay. I started getting the hang of it and I started enjoying it a lot more. Mm-hmm. And just like, I guess like as I grew up and with university coming in, I didn't have enough time to like train as much. So singles became a lot harder because like you need to keep up like physically mm-hmm. and just like you need to spend a lot of hours like training. Yeah, so with mix, yeah, I just kind of started liking it a lot more just because I understood it. Okay. And it just slowly became, like, my best event. Okay. Yeah. Did you find that mix was a bit more fast-paced than playing women's doubles? Oh, a lot, like, way faster. And there's why I liked it a lot more, because women's doubles is just, it's very slow-paced. It's a, okay. like a, I would say it's like a game of patience. Uh, okay. I do not have that kind of patience, so. Fair. It's yeah. like marathon versus sprinting type of thing. Yeah. Almost. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. So you talked about kind of how uh, training for singles is a lot more intensive. So can you kind of walk us through kind of, I guess, the typical week that you have in terms of training uh, as of this moment type of thing? Just because I know that both your mixed partner and then your doubles partner live mm-hmm. in Ontario. So I can mm-hmm. understand how that's a little bit more difficult to have mm-hmm. um, playing time together. So could you just walk us through like what you're hearing? with that uh yeah so usually we there's these like so the, there's these senior elites that happen every in every province mm-hmm. so yeah. usually they would come a week early like say if the alberta one they'll come a week early and we'll train mm-hmm. or for the toronto one i'll go a week early and i'll go train there or like even because we're on the go for so much the past two years due to mm-hmm. olympics mm-hmm. like we've just been constantly together so we're just training together constantly like between like games like between tournaments yeah so we train like decent amount together Mm -hmm. and there'll be like other Canadian teams as well there so we get quite a bit of practice in okay so you do happen to get to see them and play with them quite often then from the sounds of it yeah so like but last year between July and October we did four tournaments in a row and then we had six days off to go oh. home and rest and then we're on the tour again for another four weeks oh my yeah. god so i'm spending so more asking... time sorry continue <laughs> oh yeah no i'm just spending a lot more time like training with him than i am even at the active training oh my gosh that's yeah. crazy that's really good then then you guys are be able to do that so do you do that like how do you split time between your mix and your doubles partner uh so doubles i actually so mix was like my main focus for okay. olympics Mm-hmm. Um, my doubles partner Catherine sh- we didn't start our partnership with the intention of Olympics actually okay. it was just more like I was getting out of a partnership and I was focusing on mix and she was looking to get some international experience mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I told her I would play with her if she was understanding that mix was still my focus. Okay. Yeah, so definitely more focus on the mix than doubles. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So I guess it's more like a 70-30 split with like 70 being like mix. Oh, yeah. More. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of cool. So um, I know we're just talking about your um, training a little bit here, but I also want to backtrack to the tournament. So I also mm. want to kind of go over what it was like to play your first big international tournament. Because I mm. like as a junior. So, so uh, hi, Ellen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for it, so for people who um. Saw that. Sorry to have that interrupted, but that was Alex, our previous vice president from the last school year. He just loves being the center of entertainment, so he decided to drop in for a little bit. Um, for backtrack to, um, yeah, so what was it like as your first international tournament? Just because I know, like, you're probably a bit younger and you got to see a lot of like higher level players, like people that you usually see on YouTube and things like that potentially or whatnot, but much older and stuff. So or I guess it wouldn't be because they're in the junior ones, so scratch that. But <laughs> how was your international tournament in juniors, Pan Am? My first international junior Pan Ams. It was it was an interesting experience because mm-hmm. it was in Guatemala. Oh, and like it was 2008, so mm. they were still considered like a third. Well, I mean, they're still considered a third world country, but like they were really poor. Mm. And we got off the plane, mm. and we they put us in a a chicken bus. What I kid it you it? not, it's a bus where they put chickens in. Oh, so really? so it's it's a school bus with like <laughs> racks on the top where they would put cages of chickens. Oh my god! And like, we were. Could yeah, you- and we were escorted with like two trucks, one in front, one behind us, with like four men in the back with mm-hmm. guns, and it was for our safety apparently. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and we could not wander um, outside of the tourist area because they said it was dangerous. Like our our safety was. Oh my god. Yeah, it was it was scary. Did your parents know this before they let you go? <laughs> My dad came with me, so... Okay. Oh. Yeah. I don't think he knew either. I don't think anyone knows. I guess, yeah, I guess not. Like, not that intensely. Like, I didn't know that they were, like, that intense on, like, security. Like no, that. I mean, like, I went to Guatemala last year for a tournament, mm-hmm. or the year before, and it's a lot better. But, like, okay. 2008, oh, it was... Yeah, it was quite scary. Oh, like, even, like, stores, like, mm-hmm. there were people carrying guns everywhere. And their convenience stores was just, like like a little booth and then yeah. there's a cage and you just point to what you wanted and you'd slip the money under and they slip the item and oh trade God. that way. Yeah. Like in those movies at those like um, stores where they sell like guns on the black market type of thing. Yeah. Black. Oh yeah. So that was uh, definitely an interesting first experience. Yeah. yeah. Can imagine like you're like, oh, can I just buy a chocolate bar? And then they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of Bampton, it was it was exciting because yeah. in Canada, when people are watching Bampton, it's yeah. fairly quiet. Like people just clap like after the rally. Like golf. But yeah, but in <laughs> South America, like people bring drums and horns. People, yeah, it's it's crazy. It was like a and we're pl- it's my first time playing a huge stadium. Mm-hmm. So yeah, with all like the noise happening, there's so many people watching. Yeah. Yeah. So it was definitely an, an interesting and fun experience, actually. What, was it hard to stay focused in an environment like that? Because I could imagine like the horn, like yelling, like cheering and stuff. Uh I think for some people maybe, but for mm-hmm. me, I was. I think when I'm focused, like I can mm-hmm. kind of zone everything out. So good for you. Too. But definitely the hardest part was just like because I'm playing at such a big venue, mm-hmm. like your depth perception changes. There's all of a sudden like draft going on, like so the air, like the aircon's blasting. Okay. Yeah, so that was actually no Guatemala didn't have aircon. Sorry, it, they just opened the windows on the top, so okay. it was just pure wind. Yeah, it was like, yeah, oh, that's and, so cool. and then there's birds flying in. Oh my god! Yeah, it was oh yeah. <laughs> Did they actually, like, did they ever fly close to the course? Oh, yeah. They're just, they, they couldn't control it because that was the only airflow that they could get to, like, kind of 
air out the place was not as hot because it was like 30 some degrees oh my god it yeah traumatizing what if you went to swing for the bird and then you hit like the legit bird <laughs> yeah bird. there's definitely some close calls and oh there's like goodness. there's bird poop on the court so you they have to pause and they just have to like kind of sweep it and clean it okay yeah Oh my god, that sounds kind of like thrilling, yet kind of like terrifying at the same time. I could like imagine you as like a small person being like, what is going on? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was definitely interesting. I mean, I think that was just, yeah. Very cool, very cool first experience. I know. So after that, um, did, did you find like, did you like find it more fun playing international tournaments after your first exposure? Or was it more kind of like, oh my gosh, like there's, it's like, it's so different. Oh, definitely. Because I wanted to, I guess like, I wasn't satisfied. Like, I mean, I won doubles, so I was mm-hmm. happy about that. But like mm-hmm. singles and mix, I thought, oh, I can do better. Oh, okay. and, and because like the tournament's only once a year, like that was mm-hmm. even more motivation mm-hmm. of like, next year I want to do better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and that just kind of, yeah, just made me want to play more and more. And just because like you play different people too because of the age category in different countries. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got a lot more exposure to different styles because even every country has their different styles, so. Yeah, yeah. So, like, can you, can you kind of share with us what your perspective is on, like, the different playing styles? Just because I don't yeah. think very many people know of those. Yeah, so I found that a lot of the South American countries are, mm-hmm. they have a lot of heart. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is that they never give up. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm not going to lie, like, like, for like Canadians and even Americans like when we tend to be down like by like 10 points we yeah. tend to not give up but we are not playing with as much fire as we would in the beginning of the game yeah. but for like South American countries like they don't care what the score is mm-hmm. they go 100% every single rally and so mm-hmm. what made it dangerous was that you could be up six or seven points feel mm-hmm. comfortable and mm-hmm. the moment you lose focus they could easily just come back yeah and just like slowly and then it made you feel nervous and all of a sudden the game's back on like a leveled playing field yeah 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 whereas like yeah and then whereas like the americans they're more similar to canada Mm -hmm. but they i I would say they have a bit more fire in them just because they grow up playing more internationally okay yeah so as the junior pan ams actually starts from age uh, I think U11 is the youngest age. Oh my but God. Canada doesn't send a team until U15. Oh. Because we have this uh, thing where they said that they don't encourage kids that young to be so focused on one sport. They'd rather us focus on a lot of sports. Okay. So that's why they don't send us till U15. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. What about like the European and the Asian countries? Because badminton is really big in some parts of those. Mm-hmm. So I find that Europeans, they're not as skilled. No, I shouldn't say that. They're not as fast. Like physically, they're not as fast, mm-hmm. but they play a lot smarter. Okay. And so, like, when I play in European countries, it's more like a tactical game. Okay. And it's really easy for them to kind of outsmart, like, feel out, like, when we feel. Uh, when we play them, I feel like I'm being outsmarted by them. Okay. Versus, like, Asia is just pure, like, strength. They beat you through strength and, like, agility, basically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question about the European playing style. Is mm-hmm. there more kind of, like, tactical? Does that, does that usually equate to having more trick shots being played on court if it's more strategic? No, it's more like they have set plays. So a lot of these European countries, they have, mm, like, a set play as in like a a systematic way of how they win points. Okay. So say like a common one would be like if you have a lefty righty combo, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the righty will always set up so that if your opponent's not thinking about the left right, you could easily just hit into the, the left handed's forehand and you immediately get burned by a shot. Okay. It's kinda hard to explain. Like if if a righty were to lift cross court. Okay into the lefty straight forehand yeah. and if you if you weren't to think and you smash straight down the line uh, they would just hammer the like that return cross with their forehand okay. and so there's like like that's just an example but 
yeah, that's the kind of like set plays that they would have. And if you weren't paying attention, you would just fall into that trap and you just lose multiple points like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I can imagine that. Are there lots yeah. of different, like, do different areas, I guess, have different types of set plays? Or, like, as inter- in internet, or, sorry, badminton as a whole, does it have, like, set things that you can do, like, patterns of how people play that can apply generally to players? Uh, I think it's more individually to the team because it all depends on what you're good at. Like everyone has like certain shots where they excel at. Mm -hmm. And so they use a combination of that to like, yeah, just to set up for points and just like different like playing styles too. Like if you're a power player, you're obviously setting up for a smash. Okay. Yeah. So things like that. Okay. Yeah. So if you could pick any team to kind of play against, just for like, I guess more for like the fun and the speed aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Like, which one would you want to play with? I guess I think I'd pick Yuta Watanabe and Higashino. I forgot her first name. Okay. Arisa, Arisa Higashino. Okay. Yeah, from Japan. Okay. Yeah, they're definitely one of my top, like one of my favorite teams currently mm-hmm. on this circuit. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Have you ever had the chance to play with them before? No, I actually haven't played any of the top four teams the highest i've ever played was uh i think they're ranked fifth or sixth the mm-hmm. malaysian team chen ping soon and go liu yang okay yeah so they're the only top 10 team we've ever played i think oh okay or actually no we played an indonesian like ninth ranked team in okay yeah I was like, I don't know who they are, but... It, it oh, means... like Gloria and Hafish Faisal. I, yeah, their names are kind of hard to pronounce. Well, that's really good. I don't remember their names. I'm like, I don't know names, but I'm like, oh my God, good for you. <laughs> I watch a lot of Bounton, so... <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. So you did, like, you did just kind of, like, talk about meeting, like, getting to play, like, the, uh, I guess, the top... One of the teams from the top ten. Mm-hmm. What was it first like when you got to play with, like, a lot of these big names? I'm assuming you had an opportunity to kind of, like, at least one time be at the same tournament as some of, like, the bigger name players. Mm. What was that kind of like for you? Um, It was hard to not get starstruck. (laughs) Like, like when you're so used to watching these people on YouTube and you idolize them and all of a sudden Mm -hmm. they're, like, in front of you or even you're playing against them, Mm -hmm. it's hard to kind of set, you know, the fan side of me Mm. apart from like I'm now an opponent or like I need to see myself as like kind of like on the equal level just so like I have the confidence to like play you know it's hard to go into a game thinking I'm like thinking you're less than them yeah so yeah almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy at times it can be (laughs) and you're like oh man yeah I can see that I can also see how it's like so like like if I were to be you in that position, I'd be like, oh my god, there's no screen in between. Like all I have to do is really walk up to you and like yeah. I could socialize with you. Yeah, it's so hard to not be intimidated. Mm. But like I guess like you just remember that in the end they're they're still human. Yeah. Yeah, I think mean, that's that was the hard well, not hard, but it's just the craziest thing that I had to just accept. Like they're just human and I like now they're my opponent or yeah, now I'm in the same circuit as them. Yeah, I know exactly how you feel. Funny side story. One time I was living in Toronto and I was serving at this restaurant. Yeah. Do you know who Tony Ja is? From Tony Tony who? Tony Ja. He's an actor. No. Okay, so he's like this guy. Nobody knows him, it's fine. Um, (laughs) So he was was actually one of the, he was one of the characters in a Fast and Furious movie, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, guy guy with like the big muscles and like the tight black t-shirt i don't, want to <laughs> that. I don't remember that in detail <laughs> but yeah he was also in a movie called own back so it was this Thai movie about this like guy from a village and he's like super like intense martial artist and somebody to- uh, stole their um village's artifact like their buddhist yeah. artifact and so he had to go take it back anyway he was in toronto and i got to serve him and nobody else really knew who he was, but I did. And I was there, and I was, like, trying not to freak out, like, what you yeah, were calling yeah. me at the tournament. Yeah. I was, like, and then I remember my manager is telling me, you know, if you ever meet, like, um, I'm a celebrity, you have to act, like, normally. Just treat yeah. like a normal human being. Because yeah. they're there to have, like, you know, do their thing. Yeah. 
And so like, I was just kind of standing there in my mind. I was like, oh, like what? Like, oh, he was like, I'm from Thailand. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I know what you, why you're doing this <laughs> movie. Well, I couldn't say that to him. So I was like, oh, that's so far away. Like, why are you here? And then he's like, I'm here to film a movie. And I was like, oh, you're just going to outright say it. So I was like, okay. I was like, that sounds cool. And I just nonchalantly just talked to him for a bit. And I left him, but inside I like, I had my like tag girl yeah. <laughs> I could only imagine. Yeah, that's like me with every player. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. But then you can't really like do that because you're like, you know, like trying to be on the same level for you at least. Yeah. You're like, you know, like I have to approach you like just another human being and yeah. stuff. Because we are like players and I'm going to be playing against you. And yeah, I be, like, can I get your autograph? And like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's embarrassing because like some of the players. Mm-hmm. I've gotten photos in the past mm-hmm. and now like people always ask me like oh do you get photo with them like oh no I can't now like now that I'm like playing the same circuit it's mm-hmm. it's different because you see yeah. them yeah. often yes yeah I think it's like almost comparable to like if you were to just go up to like because you're like I could you could maybe I don't know if you guys are considered friends and like your guys' perspective or not but mm-hmm. if you were in my mind it's kind of like if you were to just go up to your friend randomly and be like hey can we get a picture together you know <laughs> yeah. in the middle of doing something it's like it's not a birthday it's not like a get together you're just yeah. kind of like at the library and you're like hey can we get a picture together and they're kind of yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I can't see that happening that's that is really really cool though but I think like that's even almost even better than like getting a picture with them because you actually get to know them right like it's not just like a physical thing oh, God, kind of like we don't get to see everyone like mm-hmm. I usually see the people who are within our who play like within our time frame mm-hmm. yeah so we get to see everyone but yeah you get to see like a couple of them and it's just yeah, it's just pretty cool like mm-hmm. I think back uh, when I played my first Sudaman Cup that was like probably the biggest because, like, Lin Dan was there, Li Chong Wei was there, Chen Long, Zhang Nan. Like, all the big names. And that was my first tournament with them. So mm-hmm. that was a huge... Yeah. That was just... I was just starstruck. Left oh and right. <laughs> you speak Mandarin, right? Yeah, I do. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, but That's I don't cool. think I have the guts to go up <laughs> and just be like, Hey, <laughs> what's up? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that would be totally cool, though. Like, I would totally just be like... Even like if I were to like I don't know very much Mandarin, but I know yeah. how to do Nihao. So yeah. even drop that, be like, I I can socialize with you for a bit. <laughs> that would be really. I don't know. I don't know if they would be like kind of offended though, or like open to it. Because you uh-huh. know, sometimes like for some people, like I don't know if you've ever gone this, but like. Um, like, because I don't actually speak Mandarin, but, like, sometimes mm-hmm. the strangers, like, see me, and, like, they see that I'm Asian. Yeah. Like, oh, ni hao, or, like, konnichiwa, or, like, oh, yeah. Korean version, like, annyeonghaseyo, like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think for them, because they're at an older age, like, mm-hmm. I think, like, if they were younger, it'd be a bit different, but because mm-hmm. they're, like, already dads and, like, 36, mm-hmm. they've gone through how many Olympics, how many world championships, they're mm-hmm. a bit less... I don't want to say less sociable, but they're they've gone they've definitely gone through any sorts of types of small talk. I guarantee oh, it, and they're kind of desensitized. Yeah, jaded. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. see that. Oh my gosh, that's insane. So when you did start playing internationally, I'm kind of curious. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I know that, like, it does sound like you are a fairly, like, competitive person and you do have a competitive side to you. As you started playing more competitively, did, did any of the fun start of, start dying at all? Kind of, like, did it ever change? Uh, yeah, I think for sure, like, when, I think when I first got on the national team, mm-hmm. where it kind of hit me of, like, oh, this is not just a hobby anymore. This is kind mm-hmm. of, like, my job. Yeah. And but I still I was still doing school then, so I guess it didn't hit me as hard, but definitely like this past year where I took a year off school. Well I graduated, but I still like went back and did a couple courses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like just being like full time school this past year has definitely kind of changed just because there's so much pressure that you put on because like this is the only thing I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And when you're not seeing like the results and everything, you, you can't help but feel kind of disheartened, I guess yeah yeah so definitely frustrating but yeah I just gotta keep 
reminding myself to just you know I do in the end because I have like I mm-hmm. like I enjoy badminton so mm-hmm. yeah I can understand how difficult that must be just because like you know you're as a student and then you're training too like not even just in badminton are you working hard but just like in your whole life it seems like you're putting all your energy into it and like every like putting your 110 percent and like having those days where you aren't doing as well as you would want to or like aren't winning the games that you think that you're able to can kind of really you know can kind of really put a dent in like and then you're playing a little bit yeah Mm -hmm. yeah I mean it's I think in the end I have to tell myself that I made the choice of like taking on school in Bounton so I think that kind of helps like I put myself in that position so I need to like take responsibility for my actions in a sense mm-hmm. yeah I love that accountability is so big yeah. yeah what was it kind of like can you elaborate a little bit more about like I guess your typical things that you think you're doing school, your exams, your um, 